welcome to week two of the program. This is day six, and i um, glad you're back. I hope you're gonna have fun. We have a lot going on this week. Um, our scale of the day is B major, and B major has five sharps, F, C, G, D, A, and our minor is G sharp minor. So starting this week, since we learned how to notate notes last week, starting this week, we're going to be um, talking about the intervals of each scale, the scale degrees, and the chords, just so you guys can get a little bit more out of the scales. So, um, and I'll also have a link posted up for this if you wanted to visualize. I'll have pictures as well. But let's talk about the intervals of um, B major. So our tonic is B, C sharp is our major second, D sharp is our major third, E is our perfect fourth, F sharp is our perfect fifth, G sharp is our major sixth, our A sharp a sharp is our major seventh, and B is our perfect eight. And um, again, with intervals, make sure if this is something that you want to notate and write down as well, make sure that for major, you're always doing a big M, and for minor, you put a small M, and if you like, with a line over the M. Next, we're gonna um, talk about the scale degrees of B major. So our tonic is the B, C sharp is our super tonic, D sharp is our median, E is our subdominant, F sharp is our dominant, G sharp is our submedian, A sharp is our leading tone, and B is our octave. And the triad chords for B major is our, um, and you will have Roman numerals here, our, our one chord is B, D sharp, and F sharp. And then I'll have small nu Roman numerals for the minor chords and big Roman numerals for the major. So the C sharp minor chord is C sharp, E, G sharp. Our D sharp minor is D sharp, F sharp, A sharp. Our E major, which is the four chord, is the E, G sharp, and B. Our five chord is F sharp major, which is F sharp, A sharp, C sharp. The sixth chord is the G sharp, and that's G sharp, D, and D sharp. And then our seventh chord is A sharp diminished, which is A sharp, C sharp, and E. And these could kind of be like arpeggios, so go ahead, I mean, if you want to um, play these, you can. It's just a great way to um, play the chords, the triad chords is a great way if you want to start um, developing your harmony um, and improvising if you want to do stuff like that. Knowing the triad chords of a major are super important, this will be very useful um, for that scale. So that's our scale for the day. Um, we're going to learn uh, this week about type of learners. Um, there's, five, there's four types. Tactile, which is hands-on. Aural, which is listening. Visual, which is seeing. And verbal, which is speaking. So every week we'll talk about that. Every day of this week we'll talk about that. And I'll show you also what that looks like when you practice. So... Is, so I'm going to talk a little bit about tactile learners. Uh, and so tactile learners are people who have high levels of energy. Um, they notice and appreciate the physical world around them, such as textures, enjoy sports and exercise along with outdoor activities and working with their hands. They have excellent motor memory. They can do some, they, they can repeat something after doing it once and they perform well in art and drama. So if you're someone who less likes getting their hands-on experience, then you are m most likely a physical learner, which is tactile, and physical learners are animated and they learn best by going through the motions of what they're learning. So, for example, if something's bothering you or you're trying to wrap your head around a concept, you rather go out for a run or a walk than sit down and figure it out. So you're a physical learner if you don't like, if you don't learn something until you do it. You need to draw out your own diagrams or role play to learn new information. You may also be in constantly in motion and speaking with your hands. So um, the next part of this is we're going to learn how ways that musicians can practice as ta tactile learners. So one of the ways that you can practice as a tactile learner is through air fingering. Now there's two ways. One way is to use your wrist and just kind of like go up the fingering. So one open, 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 bum, 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 like this being first. 
second, third, fourth. That's one way to do it. Another way is to use your instrument. So I'm going, I'll just say the finger out loud so you can follow with me. One, open, two, 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 three, one, two, three. Open, two, 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 three, one, two, three. And then harmonic, bum, 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 bum. So that's a great way to practice is through air fingering. Another way to practice tactile is to practice a spot backwards. So I'm playing the mosquito dance for this. So the way that we can practice backwards is I'm going to take this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this eight bar phrase, um, which can be complicated, and I'm going to go back one by one. Now, any time that I get a measure right, I'm going to add another measure. So I'm going to go, um, I started at 32, and I'm going to be at 31. Now I'm going to go back another. And go back another. And go back one more. And go back another. One more measure. I'm going to go back one more, and that's going to be the whole bar phrase. And that's a great way also to practice memorization is to go back one by one because you have the memory of that. So that's one. Another way to practice is practicing a spot with different rhythmic patterns. So we're going to still play mosquito dance and we're going to start at 33. So for instance, let's say we're having issues with the 16th note. So another way you can play that is And then you can play the rest of the 16th notes that way. Um, that way it's just it's taking away from playing the right rhythm, but also another way to play it if you just can't get everything um, just right. Another way to practice different rhythms is... And I think I'm just going to play measure 34 to 30, 36 so that you guys can hear the different kind of rhythms. Um, and I can play that backwards too. That's a great way to learn. And then at the end, after you're confident with that, you can play the, as the rhythm as written. Especially for a fast um, spot like that, it would be best to break it up in different patterns. Another way to practice um, as a tactile learner is to clap the rhythm. This is the most popular one. If you can clap it, you can play it. So I'm going to clap measure 33. And that's going to be two eighth notes and then sixteenth notes. So bum 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 bum. And anytime you have complicated rhythms, it's always best to kind of just clap it out. Um, just clap it out, and um, once you're able to clap it, you'll have you'll be a lot more confident than playing it. So those are ways that you can practice as a tactile learner. So tomorrow we'll talk about um, what are all learners and how to practice that way. So next we're going to talk about practicing and how not to go on autopilot mode. So as a musician, it is often hard not to go into autopilot mode because going into autopilot mode means that when you're practicing, but your attention is just not fully there. It is the same way when you're reading and all of a sudden you realize that um, your eyes are down the page but you kind of your thoughts were kind of distracted and you were thinking about something so you have to go back and reread that right so you're distracted so that's the same thing about like going on autopilot mode um 
But when we go on autopilot mode, it can be dangerous sometimes practicing because we can be creating bad habits without realizing it. So here are a few tips to keep you from going into autopilot mode when practicing and how to, I guess, um, just to have an efficient practicing session. So the first part is routine. Sometimes having a set routine can cause us not to be as attentive. So I would suggest try practicing in different spots. If you always practice, let's say in your room, try one day practice in another part of the house, in the basement or the office. So practicing in different spots, also practicing at different times during the day. So not always practicing at set 10 a.m. You know, try one day doing it a little bit later, doing it a little bit earlier. Um, and then practicing different techniques and pieces will also help that. So let's say if you have scales, A2, Z, Brado, pieces, and etc. to practice, try focusing on one every day or time you practice. Like, don't practice. Try the way to have a more efficient practice session is not to practice um, everything at once. If you, Let's say if you can break it up in a day your goal is to practice an hour you can break it up into like 20 minutes there 20 20 or you can do 15 15 15 15 or you can do two sessions half an hour and half an hour and in the morning let's say if you want to split it up twice in the morning you're going to practice scales and maybe some uh like a vibrato and then in the afternoon you're going to practice your repertoire so that way your attention is fully on something because if you practice something for a long time we just get tired. It just is, that's just normal. So splitting up your times and in chunks instead of just doing it all at once is a, is a better way to prevent going into autopilot mode. Um, so that's what I would recommend is that every time you practice, you kind of just solely focus on one thing. And the next time you practice will be dedicated on practicing your etudes or exercise or however you like. So first part is routine. Second part is to add new things in your practice session. So I suggest and highly recommend all of my students to work on at least one piece that you are excited for because um, the other things that we're learning, they're beneficial, but they may not be all as interesting as other things. So always have one thing. Um, if it's like a pop song, if it's a movie music song or anything like that, have one thing that you're really excited for. That way, if you need a break and you're frustrated at your work, you can focus on this for a little bit and then come back and work on those things. So adding a new element to the practice session has you looking forward to something that you're excited for and eager to learn. Routine adding new things to your practice session. Third is switching up your warm up. So anything you do, you're warming up for, for exercises, for runs, right? We have stretches that's warming up. So um, with practicing, we also warm up. Some people, most people warm up with scales. Now practicing scales is not a bad thing, but switching up your warm up may, will also help you. So um, warming up by practicing skills, like I said, is great, but maybe practice skills differently. Just don't always do skills the same exact way. Just do it differently some days, like playing the arpeggios of the, of the scales or practicing harmony by playing the chords. Like I was telling you about the triad chords of each scale, you can do the same thing for that. Or you can practice vibrato with your scales. Not having a set routine of a practice session will help you from going into autopilot mode and being a hundred percent attentive um so routine add new things to your practice session switch up your warm-up next we have keeping in mind the learning process so i define the learning process of starting something new like a piece this way you first learn the notes it doesn't matter having the rhythm it's just getting every single note down once you have the notes down you move then to the rhythm. You incorporate rhythm with your notes. So you have notes and rhythm. Once you got those two down, the next step is to add phrasing, um, adding crescendo, the right tempo and all of that. So you're adding phrasing to the rhythms and the notes. And the last bit is um, memorizing. This is like the final stage of it, is memorizing your music and you're about like ready to perform it. So, um, a way to switch up your practice routine is to focus one day, like say you're starting a new piece, to focus one day on each uh, 
aspect of the learning process. So if you're starting something new, day one, you're just going to learn the notes. That's just going to be a priority. Second day, you're going to learn the rhythms. You're going to practice the rhythms. You're going to get the rhythms down. The third day, you're going to focus on putting those um, phrases, the dynamics, um, and all that in there. And day four, you're going to practice on really getting the piece just sounding um, more like a work that's coming alive kind of a thing. So um, that's what I would recommend if this is something, especially if you're starting something new, I would recommend to, you know, split up the days. You don't have to learn everything in one day. The more efficient way to learning things is by splitting it up. So we have routine adding new things to your practice session, switching up your warm-up. We have keeping in mind the learning process. Fifth thing is searching up all the definitions. So this can count as practice time, is that um, you're looking up the definition of the tempo if you're not quite sure and you don't know the tempo marking for that. You're looking up the certain words in there that you've just never seen before that are more complicated than writ, ritardando, and crescendo, decrescendo, just stuff you haven't really seen. So um, knowing what each words mean in your piece is very important. Um, this is like a key to knowing the right character feel and um, searching up the definitions and practicing these character spots is a great way to be engaged in the practice session. So I really recommend that. You could always just Google it. Um, it could be the word and music definition and you'll always find it online. So that's a great way to practice. Next is storytelling. Last week we talked about how phrasing and all this um, just brings a piece alive. So storytelling, um, keeping in mind the mode of the piece, you know, the mood, the, um, the key signature, if it's happy, if it's sad, if it's fast tempo, slow tempo, keeping all those in mind and creating a story in your head that will keep um, practicing fun because just like you're constantly creating a story in your head while playing music to it. Um, you could do so if it's hard for you to do so without anything, I would say um, make a copy of the music and write down the key words. Like say if this is a um, marching kind of song, you're going to write soldier on a journey with a horse riding a horse up the hill right and then different sections are adding different words right so that way you can keep it in mind while you're playing because sometimes it can be hard of thinking of something while you're also playing your music and that's like a lot to pay attention to so that could be an easy way for it the last thing you can do to um, switch up your practice routine is to keep a record of what was worked and accomplished on during the practice session so you know writing down on a notebook I worked on this I worked on learning all the notes for this new piece yada yada that's that way you can know what you worked on and what you still have left to work on in the week because I'm pretty sure all your teachers will tell you everything you need to get done to work on um, for by next week so um, this is a great way not to forget things as we I know I have students I know some students do forget um, what they were told but this is a great way to do it maybe on the top of the list you can write everything you need to get done that your teacher requested you and then you can keep that in mind throughout the week so it doesn't have to be long records how did you do I didn't do great at this this was great just jot down the things you worked on so that's another way to keep you engaged. So these are all very effective ways to keep your focus 100% and you can try one every day. That's what I would suggest you do as well. There are seven different ways. So maybe this next week you'll focus on a different thing every single day. So yeah. Anyways, next we're going to talk about is our composer of the day, Georges Bizet. So Georges Bizet and Paul Alexander César Leopold Bizet was born in Paris, France in 1838. He was a French composer, best remembered for his opera Carmen. His realistic approach influenced the Verissimo school of opera at the end of the 19th century. So what Verissimo means, it's Italian for realism. It's a style of Italian opera writing that flourished in the last decade of the 19th century. So Bizet was born in a musical family. His father liked to sing and his mother was a gifted 
amateur pianist, so Bizet's musical talents were recognized so early that he was admitted to the Paris Conservatory before he even completed his 10th year. He studied with accomplished composers and quickly won a number of prizes, including the Prix de Rome. So the, the Grand Prix de Rome was a group of scholarships awarded by the French government from 1660s to 1960s and having a young French artists to study in Rome for about three years to study abroad. It was so named because the students who won the Grand Horfers Prize in each artistic character category went to study in the Académie de France in Rome. So that's the Grand Depuis and pretty much every composer we're going to talk about this week has won the Grand Depuis. so you'll hear this a lot. Um, Bizet has shown talent for composition far more superior to that of just a young boy. His first stage work was performed when Bizet was only just 19 years old. His work at such a young age could be easily compared to the talent of either Mozart or Mendelssohn. And that were in, um, comparing those works is when they were also the same age. So all these works are very comparable. Bizet had flowing and resourceful harmonies, orchestra expertise, and a happy blend of the Viennese classical style with French melody. Bizet was aware of his gifts and the essential danger in his facility, as he has stated, I want to do nothing chic, he wrote from Rome. I want to have ideas before beginning a piece, and this is, that is not how I worked in Paris. In Rome, he studied with famous composers Robert Schumann, Karl Maria von Weber, and Mendelssohn. In spite of very decided opinions, Bizet was still immature in his outlook in life, youthfully cynical, and was plagued by artistic conscience that accused him of preferring the moving charm in music to be to the truly gate. great. He was even ashamed for his admiration for the operas of his Italian contemporary Giuseppe, Giuseppe Verdi and longed for the faith and vision of the typical romantic artist which he could never achieve. It was in the first flush of his new emotional maturity, but with still some um, youthful enthusiasm, that he wrote his masterpiece, Carmen. I will leak a few pieces for, um, from the opera for you guys to watch if you haven't already seen it. So I'm pretty sure you've heard Habanera and all these um, um, popular um, pieces from Carmen um, so far. So I will link that for you if you want to listen to it. Um, the realism of the work, which caused a scandal when it was first produced in 1875, was to introduce a new chapter in the history of opera and the combination of brilliant local color and directness of emotional impact with moving workmanship and a rich melody that have made this opera a favorite of musicians and public alike. The scandal caused by Carmen was only beginning to yield to enthusiastic admiration when Bizet suddenly died. So every day, anytime we're talking about Composer of the Day for um, this week and next week as well, I'll be including um, a, their mo one of their most famous pieces. That way you can put music to a face in a sense. So um, that's on Bizet. Carmen's a really great piece, and I will um, link something up for you. So that's that for today. Today's practice goal is to, to find out which type of learner you are and to keep in mind the different ways to practice um, to not go into autopilot mode. Have fun, and we'll see you tomorrow.